but there is actually a reason her observation is correct. So much of this is, of what you're seeing there is based on absolute straight lines. And then if you start, because here's 1860, um, like 1880s. take a look at 1880, you then, mm -hmm. you've started to get curves. Mm -hmm. Why are these all based on straight lines? All based on straight lines? This is when you, I, was this a lot of American fashion? I don't know. No, this is still very European, that one in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I feel like it's the same reason we start with the slopers. It's can start on, you have to know where the straight line is to alter your pattern to go off the grain. Let's, um, anyway. or is it just that they were still, they just, I don't know. <laughs> Let's take a minute, first of all, take a look at her versus her, just those two independent of everybody else. And for the moment, again, let's only pay attention to skirts. What do you see is the difference between those two skirt silhouettes? This has an underskirt that is exposed uh, right there, and then this one really doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, it is interesting that it's got this center front detail Yeah. that sort of implies that there's something underneath, but um, it isn't split. They've moved this fullness to the back. Can you be more specific? Yeah, you can see how much fabric is in the front and sort of bubbles out over her hips next to her bodice and how little there is over here but it's all been moved back to this back so you start to get this bustle. Exactly, so uh, it seems to be the same volume of fabric, it's just its placement around the body is somewhat different. Um, between what Connie noted about the split and then the underskirt and the redistribution of the fabric around the hips Ultimately, this is a much more <clears throat> this is a much more triangular fit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a much more conical fit to the body, whereas this is almost more of a cylindrical fit, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I was almost going to say bell. Yeah. Well, it does start to get bell. You know, certainly here we start to see the full bell. a full bell, and even there you see belling. But you're correct. Um, there's what about this one? What about the difference between this one and that one? What do you see? They cut back. What do you mean? I mean, like, the fullness of the skirt is taken down a lot, so it's closer to the body, and then, um... But it is similar. It's a cylindrical fit like this one, but then it uses the A, yeah. the, uh, the triangular shape to create the bustle, or the wrap around. You can also see your shoes. Is there yeah. a, the same amount of fabric here that there is here? Yeah. I think so. Is it the same skirts? It could yeah. be if they had to, if they had a cut, oh, I see. Maybe this Are they just taking it and in, tying it around the back? That's yeah. part of it, is it is the exact same skirt. It's mm -hmm. just now being dressed slightly differently. Mm -hmm. But what other significant difference do you see between there and there? The fullness in the front. You know, in a way, it's actually the exact same fullness. Mm -hmm. You know, Mary's noted that it's very, very flat there, and this is still very, very flat. The only difference is now they've taken it and, and exposed it even more by pulling all this junk back. But there's one other significant difference between here and there. I don't know if it's a pattern or if it's you know, lace it's applique, but there's all Shorter. The True. Would the, you, I'm sorry, go. I was gonna say the train is True. longer, but. I mean, interesting, this is um, sort of someplace in here is Tartuffe, isn't it? Yeah, 1675. We have a, a, a cylindrical bell. We have a cone. What do we have here? Isn't this just a cylinder? I mean, look, she's almost the same breadth at the, we at the shoulders as she is down at the hips. It's a very cylindrical fit. So what's changed if the same amount if there's the same amount of fabric, and in fact, it's potentially even the same skirts with some different trimming. Um, let's add this panel on here to make it look slightly different. Let's dress this slightly differently. If it's the exact same skirts, what's changed here? The underskirt. Dun, da, da, da. The underwear. Now take a look at the difference between this and this. Oh. 
what what difference is is this the same underskirt as that mm -hmm. sort of that happy medium between the very full and the cylinder that's true but that's not what i asked is this the same underskirt no not the same underskirt but the same overskirt it's more full in the front it may be made of a different fabric but it is the exact same underskirt then is this the exact same overskirt? It's dressed a little differently, but it's the exact same overskirt. What? Isn't the underskirt what determines whether it's that cylindrical shape or coming out to this triangle? What do you think? I think it... I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Catherine in particular. What do you oh. think? Do you think that it's the skirt that determines that? Underskirt, that's my specific. Or the underskirt that's determining that? Partly. And what's the other part? Um, well, I feel like also gathering around the waist and stuff. With sure. Say. Why did I ask Catherine? What's the answer here? Underclothes. It's the underwear again. It's just a change in what's underneath it to be able to make it hang separately, uh, make it hang differently. Take a look at the difference between this and that. Let's take a minute and flip back into the book. 1670, well, we're at 1660 right here. That's that. Take a look at her, take a look at the pattern here. Tell me, show me where the skirt is on this pattern and what shape it, um, it has. It's here. It goes. It's a rectangle. Yeah. It's a big fucking rectangle, isn't <laughs> it? The tiniest curve Now, watch, and, and so that applies to this right here. <clears throat> so where are we? We're at 1720. I like how we jump from 1660 to 1720. Take a look at bodice, 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 bodice. Now we are at 1745. So let's flip backward for a sec. Ooh, we flipped too far back. So now we're someplace in here. Tell me where the skirt is. It's here, isn't it? What shape is the skirt? It's a rectangle. It's a big old fucking rectangle. Let's jump way, oh, well, here's another one. Where's the skirt here? And what like shape is it? It's a fucking rectangle. It's a big old fucking rectangle. Big rectangle. Big rectangle. Big rectangles. Big rectangles. Big rectangles. So part of what I'm saying, when I'm saying it's the same skirt, is what I really mean is, it's the same pattern shape, isn't it? It's just been manipulated slightly differently. And um, and certainly one of the things we've talked about is that manipulation is partially the product of the quantity of fabric, the distribution of the fabric, the trim and the treatment of the fabric, but it's all the same thing over and over and over again. You know, <clears throat> I'm in Walmart this morning shopping for both the dance concert and for um, Jesus Christ Superstar. What and we are a great example of what I saw in Walmart. What is every single top in the women's section? Rectangle. It's a big old square. Everything we're wearing is a big old square. But they all look slightly different because of the fabrication, because of the, um, the distribution of the fabric, because of the color or the trim work. It's all the same stuff over and over again. Why? Why are they all rectangles? Because one of the things you're going to see here is if we jump forward to 18, that page is just way out of. And that's how you handed it to me, too? No, I know, but it's like way out of sequence in terms of time because it's someplace in here. 1840 to 1869, there's a giant jump in time. That's 
this is 1870. This is early 1860s. <clears throat> Here is the overskirt right there. It's essentially a big rectangle, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What do you see here? Because this seems to be, one of them is the underskirt and one of them is the overskirt. This must be the underskirt. What do you see in terms of shape, the difference between this one and this one? Becoming more rectangular. Well. If you put them together, kind of strange. Yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. Well, once you yes. take out the darts, it's screwing up much my geometry. Oh, say that again louder. <laughs> once you take out the darts, it's much yeah. more triangular. Look, it's like you've started off with the same rectangle, and now you've put a whole series of darts into it, which in this instance have related in separate pattern pieces. And they ultimately start to make a more triangular, conical form, don't they? Mm -hmm. What happens, his, just, just uh, as a side note, what's happened historically between 18, um, right in the early 1860s. There's a couple of, there's one major thing that happens in Western civilization at that point. Civil War. Wasn't that, no. was that the Industrial Revolution? The Industrial yeah. Revolution just happened. <laughs> so what, high school. what does that mean and how does that apply to this conversation? Wasn't that just a huge boom in, I mean, economic power, money, Textiles wealth, changed. Oh, 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 oh. Fifth factory factories and sewing improved because suddenly what was invented something for sewing was invented well it wasn't the sewing machine it was well there's a reason it's called the industrial revolution and not the what was the word you just used urbanization urbanization you used a you used the word factory there's a reason that it's called the industrial revolution and the reason is because suddenly in western civilization everything shifts into machine production. Hmm. Um, it, the, in, everything from the invention of the steam engine and the locomotive to the invention of the cotton gin, yeah. which leads into the mechanization of a loom. So how much more quickly, just in that 15 year period, how much more quickly can you produce fabric and therefore produce clothing? So one of the things we've talked about here at this point in history you would never ever cut into a rectangle because it's taken you forever to produce. Look at the way that we treat fabric now. You throw away half of the muslin that you work with, right? Um, because it's so easy to produce and, um, and, and chew through. Here, you can start to see the beginnings of that social trend. And so look at what happens. What do you start to see here in this, um, this is 1903, in this Gibson girl kind of look? Fit. Say again? Fit. You do see fit, but what was the very first thing that Razmin said when I opened this up? So many straight lines. So many straight lines. Is there a straight line in the, in the fashion here at all? Maybe in their applique, but. Not a bit. Um, and look at what happens when you start to look at the patterns. Look at the shape of the skirt now. Mm. Look at the shape of the sleeve. Oh my God. All of these sleeves are essentially rectangles, not unlike what you've done for your fiddler shirt. And suddenly we start to do crap like this. Holy Toledo. We've suddenly moved from the rectilinear to the curvilinear. Why is this important? This is important for a couple of reasons. The first reason it's important is because if you, one of the things that you're learning to do is you're learning to read a sketch. So what do I mean by that? You go. She uh, started to speak first. Uh, be able to look at a sketch, determine the lines, and determine how to, um, like the shape of the patterns, and um, how to create, you know, how to how to create the product based on that information. Yeah. What period in history are we looking at right here? 1920s. 1920s. Looking at this, 
just based on the conversation we've had in the last five minutes, what are the pattern shapes that are going to characterize this particular garment? They're all going to be very rectilinear, aren't they? But if we go backward to this, it starts to be a bit more curvilinear. Take a look at her right there, or her, or her. Yeah. What shapes are those pattern pieces? Columns. They're all columns, and so what shapes the pattern pieces? Rectangle. We're back to rectilinear again. So part of the reason we're having this conversation is because in the long run, where you're headed is trying to be able to read the sketch. In order to be able to read the sketch, you can now start to see a rectilinear sketch equals what? Rectilinear pattern shapes. A curvilinear sketch results in curvilinear pattern shapes. Let's take a minute. And of course, primarily we're talking about women's wear at the moment. Much this is reflected in a smaller way in men's wear, but it's much more easily seen in women's wear. Take a look at underwear for a minute. First of all, let's talk about what you see here. Obviously what you see here to begin with is a silhouette of what the dimensional interpretation of this corset is supposed to be, what it turns the body into. And here you see the individual pattern shapes. Even though this book doesn't have a grid work like this one does, everything is still laid out presuming that the edge of the page is the grain and they give you a scale right there. Um, and so in, in a couple of these books you can actually see that I have um, see-through grid work that I put on top of these things because then you can just copy it and then suddenly you have the grid work. And then some of them you can see you know, from 20 years ago when that kind of technology was a little less accessible where I've just drawn the grid work in on top of it. Tell me about the shapes, the form that you see, both uh, the form in terms of what the course is going to do to the body and the shapes that make up the form. For me, I immediately start to see the actual musculature of the body in terms of this comes down your front abdominals and these are like your transversus muscles. So they're all coming down into that point right at the top of the groin. Interesting. Mary just did this. It's a triangle. It's triangle. What is a triangle? Rectilinear shapes again. So if you actually take a look at our timeline here, what you start to see also is that in the bodices, everything is also very square. Now the truth is there is some curve to these. They're not dead rectangles like the skirts were, but that's mostly because nine times out of ten, people's waists are smaller than their bust lines are and their shoulders are. So there has to be some sort of curve. What do these dark rectangles represent? Bones. Those are bones. Are you ticklish? A little. Yeah. All right. Pretend my hand is hard, that it's a piece of wood. Watch what happens when I take Kristen's boob and I push a hard plane against it. What happens to it? It goes up. It, flat, it goes up and it flattens out. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for letting me feel yeah, you sure. up. I like how you problem. asked if she was ticklish. Yeah. But well, not because I was going <laughs> to. <laughs> That's true. That is a very interesting point. We've moved past it. Apparently so. <laughs> All boobs are game. <laughs> um, well, that just shows you that I th I'm thinking of her body in a completely different way. <laughs> no, totally. <laughs> um, I was here last night. <clears throat> look, at the, look at the placement of the bones. They're all very erect, because that's center back, that's center front. So they're all, they're all completely perpendicular to the waist, and they're dead straight lines. <clears throat> that's what starts to create this kind of posture. I mean, the thing that's interesting to me, this actually is the foundation of, uh, this was the sort of fundamental research that we used to make all of the bodices for uh, Tartuffe. Let's jump forward to the 19th century, post-Industrial Revolution. We all go, Ow. What do you see here? 
see a horizontal one as well? We do see a little bit of horizontal, which is interesting because you can see that we've actually got fewer bones and they're smaller bones. So we need some other things to start to support the breasts. What, but you just said, curves. we now we start to see curves. Let's jump way ahead. Can you make curved bones as a side note? What an interesting question that we're going to discuss in a minute. Yay. Take a look at that. I mean, look at what that's supposed to do to the body. Take a look at that one with the curve all up in the hip. This is your Gibson girl kind of thing. This is that true hourglass. Um, so we go from dead rectangles to dead curves. Why is this important? Because when we're so going weird. to read that sketch, are we just paying attention to the clothes that are on top? No. Why not? Because that's not what produces a silhouette. Because that's not what produces a silhouette. One of the things we've learned in the last 15 minutes is you can take a plastic bag and put it on top of a watermelon, on top of a lemon, on top of a car. And because of the car, the watermelon, or the lemon, the, ba the plastic bag is going to take on a different form, correct? So when we are producing a silhouette, what we've got to start thinking about is the understructure underneath that creates the silhouette. How are these kinds of understructures, these kinds of silhouettes from the waist down created? We are going to presume that everything from the waist up is created via some sort of corset, bra. I mean, you guys even see that today, the difference between wearing your comfortable Sunday morning bra when you're not gonna leave the house, right. <laughs> your Saturday night push-up bra, um, your Saturday afternoon going to the gym bra, those are all different, right? Um, <clears throat> and so all of those things are creating a slightly different silhouette. Um, the corset is the exact same kind of thing. But going back to skirts and thinking from the waist down, what are the items that are creating those different silhouettes? Petticoats. Petticoats. Or farthingales. What, let's start with the word farthingale. Petticoat. It's a fancy word for each What is petticoat? Farthingale. Petticoat underskirt, fluffy thing. A petticoat underskirt, fluffy thing, she says. What do those words mean? There are lots of layers of fabric that can be ruffled or not that just add more fullness that usually you can do in a cheap fabric so you're not filling fullness with like your pretty taffeta or something. Um, take a look at the difference between this silhouette and this silhouette and this silhouette. Well, actually just all four of these across the bottom. <laughs> what do you see happening to the skirt here? Fuller, 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 fuller. It's becoming more expansive. The truth is, the amount of fabric is probably the same in each fabric, but the silhouette is becoming larger and larger and larger. We know, because you've seen Gone with the Wind, what's she wearing underneath here? Well, she's wearing some sort of giant hoop, right? What's she wearing underneath here? No hoop. Say again? She's actually probably wearing a very small hoop. And in fact, it's probably almost the exact same hoop that she's wearing right there. What's she wearing right there? Petty. She's wearing petticoats. So <clears throat> how many petticoats is she wearing to be able to create that silhouette? So many. So many is what Connie says. How many petticoats is she wearing? How many petticoats is she wearing? No. How many petticoats is she wearing? That's not a petty. Well, she's probably wearing something just because it's like wearing panties, you know, so that if she pees, she doesn't pee on her dress. She pees on her underdress. But, um, well, I mean, let's be realistic. Especially at that, at that point in history, it was a totally different game, like if she got her period, right? Right. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> um, oh, I'm so glad I live now. Yeah. Yeah, women in particular, your lives have changed a lot in a couple of hundred years because here you didn't survive past childbirth. And look at you now. Look at all the children you've had and you're still alive. I know, right? You can just squat in the field, have the baby, and go. That's actually yeah. the best way to do it. It's yeah. true. Is a squat or hang from a tree. <laughs> um, are you hanging upside down or right side up? It's too good for the baby. I know. No, it's too <laughs> Yeah, spotter. Got, yeah, somebody there to catch it. That's why you got the umbilical cord, so it can just do this. It's a little Sorry, sweet. that's terrible. Sweet Jesus.
<laughs> anyway. That was early uh, Petticoats. <laughs> um, the first thing, when you go, if you were to look at the syllabus, one of the things we were supposed to have discussed at some point that we're discussing today <laughs> is how to create a period silhouette. To be able to create the period silhouette, the first question you have to address is the underwear. And in order to address the underwear for this particular class, what you're starting to address first is the petticoat. The, there's a couple of things that you're going to be able to note here. Certainly, the petticoat that she's wearing here has a lot less fabric in it than the petticoats that she's wearing here. Mm -hmm. But what happens if I take this petticoat and put four of them one on top of the other? You look fat. <laughs> Do you look fat? That's a really good question. No, because they start from your waist down. Exactly. So what's going to happen is you're going to start with this, and then you're going to put another petticoat on top of it, and it's going to become this, and then it's going to become this, and it's going to become this. So she potentially is wearing like three petticoats, one on top of the other. For those of you who were around when we did Little Women the Musical, one of the ways that we created the silhouette there was everybody wore two petticoats in addition to other things. Let's take a look, let's go back up here to this gal right here, or yeah. this, this gal, or even this gal. One of the things that we noted before is, here, the fabric seems to be relatively evenly distributed around the hips. Here, it seems to be pushed a little further back. Here, it's pushed even further back just by virtue of the fact that we're taking all of this stuff and stacking it back here. Here, it's really big in the back. How are we creating that? Is that all from the petticoat? Bustle. What's it from? It, no, wait, the bustle was not invented then. Buckets and trains. Bustle, bucket, train. What the hell do these words mean? They're all skirt things. These are the words that crack me up because when people come in and we're talking about, is it a bustle or is it buckets? They're like, you're speaking English, but I don't understand. It's like walking into a chemistry lab. You're speaking English, but I don't understand what the fuck you're talking about. How do you get a bucket on your butt? There are some words that you want to know here. You want to know words like bum roll. Bolster is another good word. You'll define these, right? We're actually going to do more than define them. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Please tell me we're making these. You're not making them. Oh, no. I'm not telling you that. Butt pad. Is that really what they called it back then? I don't know. They probably called it, like, shit protector. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Ask Marcus I, that. I feel like your idea of this period is, like, no one has control over their bodily functions. <laughs> so, like, if I pee, at least I pee on my panty. <laughs> well, well, I mean, think about it. You're wearing this. Well, I'm also a lady. Well, you are I a lady. Have but time you still to go, have to please. walk over here to the bushes and go, uh, I mean. <laughs> don't don't I have, like, a lady in waiting, like. Holds them up. I like that. There was an the NPR her, thing about that actually. I like the fact that in Last her world, week. she's wealthy enough to have <laughs> servants to help her. Oh my pee. God. In my world, yes. we're all poor. You basically you carried you're... around your own little gravy boat. That's what you would do. Ew. Gross. This conversation needs to stop. Please. <laughs> actually, that's fascinating. Um, I learned that on NPR last week. <laughs> um, yes. So beautiful. Well, that's what I always think about is, you know, you have, this chamber pot, you have your chamber like pot crap. and then somebody comes and cleans it up later and meanwhile you're still asleep right next to it. <laughs> or you're having sex next to it. I, I don't know. It's crazy. Anyway, um, bustle. Um, Connie is correct that the, the, the actual term bustle doesn't happen until later in history and we're going to talk about why in a couple of minutes. Um, uh, the, the bottom line is, it, going back to what Kristen started to say, it kind of doesn't matter what you call it. I mean, it's interesting to me that Catherine used the word bolster, because what's a bolster? A butt pad? No. Kind of like a thing around your waist? Nope. Isn't it like the... It's a pillow on your sofa. It's okay. general, they're generally long and cylindrical, but those That's are referred a... to bolsters. Uh, waist. And bolster. I, I mean, even though the word has been even though the word has been bastardized to a certain extent, the point is that all of this refers to some sort of pillow that you put on your butt. 
Um, you could call it whatever the hell you want. Um, but it's all some sort of pillow that goes on your butt. So what happens if I put a pillow on my butt right here? I mean, you all did this when you were kids. We all did. Put a pillow on your butt right here and then pull a sheet over top of it. Well, no, did not do that. Yeah. I had a all right, taste. you take a pillow, you put it right here, right? Suddenly the fabric starts to distribute across your body in a different way. You put the, the pillow right here, you wrap the fabric around it, and then suddenly you've changed the silhouette of the body, correct? So, let's take a little field trip, shall we? We're we going to storage? We are going to storage. <gasps> we're going to storage? Uh, and ah. we're going to bring these books with us. Yay, storage Hello.